بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I hope everybody is well and uh, eager to carry on with this dars inshallah as an act of worship that we can do in these blessed days of Ramadan So continuing with Zad al-Mustaqna fi iqtisar al-Muqna of Imam al-Hajjawi rahimahullah ta'ala We are with, with the Imam's statement wherein he's speaking about the different issues pertaining to Salat al-Jama'ah excuse me, pertaining to the uh, regulations and rules of praying in congregation. So we left him where he said, وَتُسْتَحَبُّ صَلَاةُ أَهْلِ الثَّغْرِ فِي مَسْجِدٍ واحد. It's recommended that the people of Thaghr, they pray in one masjid. And the people of Thaghr, a Thaghr, it means those who are protecting the borders of Islam from enemy attack. So these are a contingent of uh, Muslim volunteers or Muslim state soldiers, Mujahideen, that are there protecting the borders from the enemy attacks. And uh, it's recommended that they pray together. The reason being is that when they pray together, they are going to be a, they're going to be like in the sight of the enemy, something which is fearful for the enemy. Okay, because the Jama'ah, the, the grouping of them together will put fear into the uh, heart of the enemy. And this is something which is matlub, something which is sought after uh, in such a situation. And of course, it depends from time to time, like Sheikh uh, Muhammad Bajabir, he mentioned in his explanation, that in today's day and age, it could be that this is not the right thing to do because of the drone attacks, etc. That if everybody is together in one place, it would be easy for the enemy to take out the uh, those who are defending the Muslim borders. So it depends upon the situation, but in any case, the author, he said that it's recommended for them to pray in one masjid. The next thing that the author recommends, he says, Regarding other than Ahl al-Thaghr, regarding other than these people that we just explained, uh, the next situation would be that it's recommended for the person to pray in the masjid that if he doesn't pray in that masjid, then the Salat al jamaa would not be there because of his absence. So this is known as Thawab Imarat al-Masajid. Thawab Imarat al-Masajid. So the author is telling us that if there is a person and with him attending that masjid, then the jamaa, then the congregation is going to be established because of him, then it's highly recommended for him to attend that masjid. It could be that he's the only person in that masjid or in that vicinity that knows how to lead the Salah. He's the only one that knows how to read the Qur'an properly. So the people in that vicinity would not establish a jama'ah unless and except if he's present there. So if he's present in that masjid, then the jama'ah will be established and therefore the thawab imarat al-masjid will be given. The reward for establishing the jama'ah in the masjid will be gotten. So in this situation, it's highly recommended that the person attend the masjid. ثُمَّ مَا كَانَ أَكْثَرَ جَمَعَةً And then the author says, apart from the Ahlul Thagr, and apart from the one who is required for that particular masjid to establish the jama'ah, it, the reward and the virtue then goes to that masjid where the jama'ah is more in terms of congregation. Because the Prophet ﷺ mentioned the hadith which Imam Nawi rahimullah ta'ala authenticated in Khulasat al-Ahkam. He said, وَإِنَّ صَلَاةُ الرَّجُلْ مَعَ الرَّجُلْ أَزْكَى مِنْ صَلَاتِهِ وَحْدَهُ وَإِنَّ صَلَاةُ الرَّجُلْ مَعَ رَجُلَيْنِ أَزْكَى مِنْ صَلَاتِهِ مَعَ رَجُلْ وَمَا كَثُرَ فَوَحَبْ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى In this hadith, uh, the Prophet وسلم, said, reported by Ubay ibn Ka'b, that for a person to pray with another person is more virtuous for him than praying by himself. And for a person to pray with two people is more virtuous for him than to pray with only one person. And in every situation where there's more people, the jama'ah is more, then this is more virtuous, more loved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the hadith clearly says that wherever the jama'ah is greater, wherever the number of people attending the masjid is greater, then the virtue there is greater. And that's why the author, he put this here, after mentioning what he mentioned about the one who is required to establish the jama'ah in the masjid. The next virtuous point that the Imam mentions in terms of virtue where a person should pray, he says, ثُمَّ الْمَسْجِدَ الْعَقْدِيقِ And then the person should select the older masjid, 
The next in terms of virtue is the masjid which is older. The masjid which has been built and been around for a longer time. And my question to yourselves is why? Why is this selection by the Imam? What does he mean by this? Why would this be in terms of virtue? Next in terms of virtue. What is one of the reasons for this? Tayyib. The author is referring to the older masjid, Masjid Al-Atik, because due to the fact that it's been around for such a long time, it means that there's going to have been more acts of worship have taken place there. So because of that, because of the fact that the masjid had contained more acts of worship than the newer masjids, therefore it's given that virtue in preference, that the next masjid in preference for a person to pray in is Masjid Al-Atik, the older masjid. However, the famous opinion in the madhab, the relied upon opinion in the madhab, is that the masjid of the larger jama'ah takes precedence to the masjid which is older. Okay, so our author he put the larger jama'ah, he put the larger jama'ah before the older masjid, right? But the famous opinion is different to it. They say that the masjid atiq comes before the uh, larger jama'ah, right? But the reason the author he chose the Masjid Al-Atiq uh, to be after the Masjid Al-Jama'ah as different to the Madhab is because that the author had a text pertaining to the virtue of praying in a Masjid that has a greater congregation which is the Hadith that we mentioned to you and whereas with regards to the Masjid Al-Atiq the Masjid being older having a greater virtue than that of the one which has a greater Jama'ah in this there is no uh, specified text from the Prophet Sallallahu rather it's from the Ijtihad of the scholars. So the author he went, he chose to go with that which is specified by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as mentioned by Sheikh Fahd Al-Maqiri in his explanation. The author mentions next in terms of um, virtue after the old masjid and after mentioning the masjid which has more uh, jama'ah he says وَأَبْعَدُوا أَوْلَ مِنَ الْأَقْرَبِ he says that the one which is further away, the masjid which is further away, is better in virtue than the one which is close. Question to yourselves, why is that the case? Why could that be the case that the masjid which is further away would be better than the one which is closer? Barakallah fiqh, jazakallah khair, exactly. And this is what the author meant because in Bukhari and Muslim, in the hadith for Abi Musa, the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna that verily the people who will get more rewards pertaining to the Salat al jamaah is the one who has to walk further to the masjid because every step the person takes he's raised the rank and one sin from uh, his uh, book of deeds is removed. Jazakallah khair. So the author he says وَيَحْرُمُوا أَنْ يَأُمَّ فِي مَسْجِدٍ قَبْلَ إِمَامِهِ الرَّاتِبِ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ أَوْ عُذْرِهِ He's mentioning now some issues pertaining to the actual jama'ah itself, the actual congregation itself. And he says that it's forbidden for anybody to lead that salah, to lead that congregation, other than the imam of the masjid, other than the official imam of the masjid. Okay? Unless the imam gives permission to that person, because the imam is absent, so he gives permission to another person to lead in his absence. Okay, or the Imam is sick and it's known that he's sick and he's not going to attend the masjid. So in that situation, somebody can take his place. Because in the hadith of Abi Mas'ud in uh, Sahih Muslim, Abi Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet said, لا يؤمن الرجل الرجل في سلطانه ولا يقعد في بيته على تكرمته إلا بإذنه that the Prophet ﷺ said in this narration that none should take the place of a person in his place of authority. Yani nobody should lead the salah uh, when somebody else is in the position of authority, meaning like an imam in the masjid. Nor should somebody sit on the designated sitting place in a person's house uh, except with the permission of the owner of that house. But the point from the hadith is that the uh, imam is the one who has sultan the imam is the one who has the authority so it's not permitted for anybody to take that authority except with his permission or unless there is an excuse there the author then moves on to say Woman salla thumma uqima fardun sunna in that whoever prays in jama'ah or whoever prays and then uh, there's a jama'ah which is established whilst he is present then it's recommended for him to repeat that jama'ah 
Okay, so this i'adat al-salah li sababin. I'adat al-salah li sababin is that if somebody has prayed, for example, in, an, in another masjid, or even they prayed at home, and then they come to another masjid and they find that the jama'ah is established whilst they are there from the time of the iqamah, that the person is there, then it's recommended for the person to repeat the jama'ah with them. Okay, and he will get the virtue of that jama'ah being a nafl for him. If the person had already prayed in jama'ah in a congregation somewhere, and then he came to the masjid and another congregation was found, then this would be i'adatu salah li ghayri sabab. Okay, the first one where I mentioned that a person had prayed by himself, so he didn't get the chance to pray in jama'ah, but then he came to the masjid or a masjid and he found that the jama'ah had been established and he's there from the time of the iqamah. This is i'adatu salah li sabab, that re repeating the salah, repeating the congregation for a reason, which was that now he has the chance to pray with the congregation. But now, if a person has already prayed in jama'ah, and then they come to another masjid and they found that the jama'ah is being established, they again are allowed to pray, but this is known as i'adatu salah li ghayri sabab, that repeating the jama'ah, repeating the congregation without reason, right? But one of the reasons that the person would maybe repeat it is that uh, apart from it being recommended, uh, is also that maybe the person leading that second salah is a very virtuous person. So to pray behind that person would be something uh, which should be done. Tayyip. The, ulama, the ulama, they mentioned a few things also pertaining to this point. They said to look intentionally for a place where a person can repeat the jama'ah is something which should be avoided. It's not something which is legislated. That you go from masjid to masjid, like your masjid prays uh, 20 minutes before another masjid, and then you go and look for the second masjid to pray jama'ah again, and then again you want to look for another jama'ah. They said this is not legislated and it should be avoided. And also, with regards to the person who is leaving their house after having prayed at home, for example, Salat al-Asr, then for this person now, going to the masjid just to pray another to pray in jama'ah would be waqt al-nahi, would be a forbidden time for this person. Therefore, it's disliked and it, sh it shouldn't be done. However, if the person went to the masjid after having prayed Asr at home, he went to the masjid for a reason like attending a um, Islamic class, an Islamic circle, and then he found that the iqamah was about to be given and um, he can then join the jama'ah in that situation. And the point that I'm stressing with regards to that the iqamah has to be given for him to be able to, uh, to catch the jama'ah is because this is what is mentioned in Sahih Muslim where the Prophet said to Abi Dhar, كيف أنت إذا بقيت في قوم يؤخرون صلاة عن وقتها How is your situation going to be, O Abu Dhar, when you will be amongst the people who delay the salah from its legislated time. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Salli salah li waqtiha thumma khruj. Pray the time by pray the salah in its time by yourself and then you can leave. Meaning then you can leave after having prayed in the correct time in the masjid at home, then you can leave to the masjid. وَإِن كُنْتَ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ فَأُقِيمَةِ الصَّلَاةِ فَصَلِّ مَعْهُمْ And then if you happen to be in a masjid and the iqam is given for a particular jama'ah, then you can pray with them. So the point is that in order for a person to be valid for him to repeat the jama'ah, he has to be there from the time that the iqama is established. The author, he says, إِلَّا المغرب. So you can repeat a jama'ah, okay, but the author is giving an istithna now, an exception. And the istithna, the exception is, except for maghrib, you cannot pray, you cannot, according to the author, repeat salat al-maghrib. My question to you, why do you think that is? Why do you think that the author is saying that you can repeat all of the jama'at, all of the congregations, except for the congregation where it's going to be Salat al-Maghrib? My question to you is, why do you think that is? Think about what it resembles. Tayyib, okay. Jazakallah khair, good try. But uh, what the author means here is that if you look at how Salat al-Maghrib is, it resembles Salat al-Witr. And the Prophet Sallallahu said that there shouldn't be two witr in the same night. And though this is in, not in the night, they say that like you cannot pray two witr in the night, you can also not pray two witr during the day. Okay, so because you've prayed Maghrib already, and then you come again to another masjid and you pray Maghrib again, this would resemble the prohibition of praying another witr. Okay, and Sheikh Bajabir, he says another ta'alil, another reason is that the 
the tatawa' of the day, the tatawa' of the day, the optional prayers during the day cannot be done in uh, in odd number, in a, in a witter way. So it's not allowed for you to pray uh, one raka as a uh, optional prayer during the day, or three raka or five as an optional prayer during the day. Tayyib. So in any case, the author he gives an istithna, he gives an exception for Salat al Maghrib. He then says, "Wala tukrahu iadatul jamaati fi ghairi masjidi, fi ghairi masjidi Makkah wal Madina." And it's not disliked for a person, it's not disliked for a person to repeat the jama'ah in other than the masjid, the Haramain of Mecca and Medina. So in these two places, in the Haramain of Mecca and Medina, it's disliked to repeat the jama'ah. But other than those masajid, it's not disliked. So if a person, uh, if a group of people have prayed with the imam in the masjid, with the uh, imam ratib, with the legislated imam, in a particular masjid then another group of people come and they want to establish a second jama'ah because maybe they missed the first jama'ah then it's permissible for them to do so the imam is mentioning okay our author is mentioning however another opinion in the madhab of imam ahmed and it's the opinion of the majority of the ulama outside of the madhab also is that the jama'ah shouldn't be repeated anywhere that once the uh, official jama'ah of an official masjid has been prayed behind an official imam then nobody should repeat that jama'ah in the sense of a second jama'ah should not be established in that same masjid. Tayyib, this is the opinion, uh, a second opinion mentioned in the madhab of Imam Ahmed and also the opinion of the majority of scholars outside of the madhab of Imam Ahmed. They should pray for rada, they should pray individually once they have realized that the jama'ah has been missed. But this is not referring to those masajid which do not have an official imam or are not established for an official jama'ah. What do I mean by this? I mean that some of the masajid are established on the, for travelers on the pathways, okay? On particular high roads, you'll find a masjid which is there and it doesn't have an imam, nor does it have a mu'addin maybe. It's there because it's known that every so often a group of travels, travelers will come by this masjid and they will need to pray here, okay? So this type of masjid, um, the dislike of praying there in a second jama'ah of course, or a third jama'ah or even more is uh, exempted. It doesn't apply to that type of masjid. The author, he mentions, that if in the masjid the, is, uh, the jama'ah is established by virtue of the iqama, then there is no other legislated prayer except for the obligatory one which is about to be prayed. Because in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said from Abu Huraira, إِذَا أُقِيمَتِ الصَّلَاةِ فَلَا صَلَاةَ that once the uh, iqama has been given for the salah, then no other salah is allowed except for the one which is being established, except for the obligatory salah which is being established. This means, as mentioned by Fahad, Sheikh Fahad al-Mutiri, is that if a person wants to pray, for example, the sunnah of fajr, like many people do, right? They come to the masjid a bit late, the iqam is being established for the fard prayer, the two rak'ah of sunnah. So what they go and do, is they go to the corner and they want to pray the two sunnah of fajr. This will not be allowed because once the iqam has been established, then no other salah is allowed except for the one for which the iqam is established, right? So no other salah will be valid to take place after the iqam. Our author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, فَإِنْ كَانَ فِي نَافِلَةٍ أَتَمَّهَا إِلَّا إِنْ يَخْشَ فَوَاتَ الْجَمَاعَةِ فَيَقْتَعَهَا However, if the person is already in a nafal salah before the iqama has been established, then this person should continue with this prayer. He should finish the two rak'ah of nafal that he is doing, unless he fears that he's going to finish, unless he fears that he's going to miss the whole congregation, meaning that the imam is praying very quickly, and by the time he finishes his second rak'ah of the nafal, then the imam is going to finish the congregation. So in this situation, he should break away from the salah. And the reason that the author is saying that the salah should be completed, the nafal salah, and it shouldn't be broken unless the person fears that he will miss the jama'ah in totality is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Surah Al-Muhammad, وَلَا تُبْتِلُوا أَعْمَالَكُمْ وَلَا تُبْتِلُوا أَعْمَالَكُمْ Do not break, do not make your actions void. Meaning that if you're in the salah, do not make it void for no reason. So you are allowed to continue with your nafal prayer if you didn't start it 
when the iqama was established, meaning you started the nafil prayer before the iqama, you are allowed to continue with it and finish it as long as you are sure that you're not going to miss the jama'ah, the congregation in totality. Now, Shaykh Uthaymin, ta'ala, just for some extra fiqh points, he has uh, a nice tafsil. And when we say tafsil, we mean extra information and a separation of the masail, a separation of the issues. Okay, so Shaykh Uthaymin, he says that if you have prayed a rakah from the nafil salah, you've prayed a rakah from the nafil salah, meaning that you finished the ruku in the first rakah, then in this situation, you should continue with the nafil salah and you shouldn't break it, you should finish it. Okay? Whereas if you haven't prayed a rakah from that particular nafil salah, then in this situation you should break it and you should go ahead and join the imam in the salah. Any idea as to what his dalil is and what his reasoning is for what I have just said? If anybody can uh, advise as to what may be the reasoning for the shaykh Uthaymin ta'ala for having said, that if you have prayed a, a rakah, then you should finish the nafil salah. But if you haven't prayed a rakah, then you should go ahead and join the uh, congregation immediately. If anybody can uh, suggest what was his evidence and why would he say such a fiqh point. Tayyib, Zakallah khair, Barakallah fiq. So the Shaykh, Rahimullah Ta'ala, Uthaymeen, what he based his point upon was in the hadith with the Prophet Sallallahu said, Man adraka rak'atan min salah faqad adraka salah Whoever catches one rak'ah from a prayer, then he has caught the prayer. So what this means is that in the nafal salah, the person who has caught the ruku means he's caught the first rak'ah, right? Therefore, he has established the fact that he's now in the salah because he's caught a whole rak'ah. Whereas the person who didn't catch the one rak'ah, didn't get to the point of completing the ruku, then in terms of legislation, he hasn't actually caught the salah, right? Because the Shaykh is saying, based upon the hadith which I mentioned, that whoever catches a rakah from the salah, then he catches the salah, right? In this opinion. So Shaykh Taymin says that if you didn't catch a full rakah, that means you haven't caught the salah. So therefore it's legislated for you to break the nafal prayer and to go and join the imam in the, in the uh, obligatory salah. And you wouldn't come under the ayah where Allah says, وَلَا تُبْتِلُوا أَعْمَالَكُمْ And don't make your actions void and nullified. Because in the first place, you didn't catch the, uh, you didn't, you didn't legislat legislatively catch the uh, nafal. You didn't complete the nafal. Okay, you didn't complete one rakah, which means you didn't legislatively uh, get into the salah as a person would if they had finished one rakah. In any case, just to recap, the Imam, he says that if a person is in the nafal, they should complete the nafal, right? Unless they fear that they are going to miss the jama'ah in totality. In that situation, they should break it and go to join the jama'ah. The author, he says, وَمَنْ كَبَّرَ قَبْلَ سَلَامِ إِمَامِهِ لَهْ لَحِقَ الْجَمَاعَ وَمَنْ كَبَّرَ Whoever makes the takbirat al-ihram before the uh, imam in the jama'ah makes the taslim, then he is... Uh, he is considered to have caught the jama'ah in its virtue. Okay, he is, he is considered to have prayed with the jama'ah. So if a person enters upon the imam, not intentionally, okay, something delayed the person, not intentionally, and he finds that the imam is about to make the taslim, okay, he's in the final tashahud, the person joins him, and as long as he's caught that part of the salah before the imam made taslim, then he's considered to have caught the congregation prayer. Why? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, فَمَا أَدْرَكْتُمْ مِنَ الصَّلَاءِ فَصَلُّوا وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَأَتِمُّوا That whatever you catch from the prayer, then pray with the, with the uh, Imam. And that which you have missed out, then complete it. Okay, so taken from the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said complete it. So it means that you did catch something from the prayer because completion is only built upon something which is already there. So by the fact that you, virtue of the fact that you caught the Imam in the uh, congregation prayer before the Imam made taslim, Okay, it means that you caught part of the prayer, and if you caught part of the prayer, you would consider have as having caught, caught the whole of the jama'ah. Tayyib, this is what the author means. So it's considered that you caught the whole of the jama'ah in this situation. Another opinion held by uh, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah and Uthaymin Ta'ala amongst the Hanabila scholars is that this opinion of the Madhab says that the jama'ah is only caught if a complete raka'ah is prayed before taslim. So if you catch the Imam, from the ruku 
either from the before the ruku or from the ruku onwards, then it's considered, then you have considered to have been caught uh, the jama'ah. If you didn't catch the raka'ah with the imam, then uh, this opinion in the madhab of Ibn Taymiyyah and Uthaymin and others says that you have not caught the virtue of the jama'ah, you have not caught the jama'ah. And, and a point to make, a note to make, as mentioned by Sheikh Fahad al Mutiri, is that uh, Salatul Jum'ah is not caught except with a raka'ah. So if you prayed less than a raka'ah in Salatul Jum'ah with the Imam, then you are, you are not considered to have caught the jama'ah. So as a recap, our author, he says that if you catch the jama'ah, if you catch the Imam in the Salah before he makes the Salim and you what, you manage to make the takbirat al-ihram, you manage to make the takbirat al-ihram, then, then you are considered to have caught the congregation salah. The author, he says, وَإِن لَحِقَهُ رَاقِعًا دَخَلَ مَعْهُ فِي رَكَعَتِهِ And if you come upon the imam whilst the imam is in a state of ruku, then you make the ruku with the imam. Okay? If you catch the imam while he's in a state of ruku, then you make the ruku with the imam. And you are considered to have caught that raka, right? But here it needs to be mentioned that the person tries to ensure to the best of his, he has to ensure that he makes the takbirat al-ihram. Okay, he makes the takbirat al-ihram and then it's highly recommended that he makes the takbirat al-intiqal for the ruku. So your imam is in a position of ruku you have to say it, Allahu Akbar, the takbirat al-ihram. And then also it's highly recommended that you make the takbirat al-intiqal to go into the ruku with your imam, okay? The author, he says, وَأَجْزَأَتْهُ أَتَحْرِيمًا وَأَجْزَأَتْ وَأَجْزَأَتْهُ أَتَحْرِيمًا And it suffices for him the تَحْرِيمَةُ الْتَكْبِرَةُ الْإِحْرَامِ What does this mean? It means that if you've come into the salah, and you made takbirat al-ihram, then this would be sufficient for you to join the imam in ruku. I said it's a must that you make the takbirat al-ihram, and it's highly recommended that you make the takbirat al-ihram. So the author is reiterating that if you make only the takbirat al-ihram, the opening takbirat of the salah, then this will suffice you, meaning that you don't have to make the takbirat al-intiqal. But with the condition that you do not have the intention that the takbirat al-ihram is also for the takbirat al-intiqal. So you cannot have the intention that this takbir, the opening takbir, is for both takbirat. It's for takbiratan. For the takbir of the opening of the salah and for the takbir of moving into ruku. You cannot have that intention, right? So as long as you don't have the intention for that, then your salah is going to be, your, your situation is going to be valid. That the takbirat al-ihram, the opening takbir of the salah would suffice you not having to make the takbirat al-intiqal, okay? As long as you don't have the intention for it to be for both takbirat, okay? Ibn Qudama and Majd ibn Taymiyyah, they said that if one makes the takbirat al uh, the opening takbir, uh, takbirat al-ihram, with the intention that it's for the takbirat al-ihram as well as the takbirat al-intiqal, then this is valid, okay? So I was saying to you that the position of the madhab uh, as the author mentions, is that you make one takbir, takbirat al-ihram, but you cannot have the intention that it's for two takbirs. However, Majd ibn Taymiyyah and ibn Qudama, uh, as in the second opinion of the madhab, they say that you can have two intentions, and the reason they give, they say, أَنَّهُمَا إِبَادَتَانِ مِنْ جِنْسٍ وَاهِدٍ Because these two acts of worship, the takbirat al-ihram and the takbirat al-intiqal to go to the ruku, are two acts of worship from the same type, okay? Therefore, if the person makes the intention of both of them, okay, does the first of them, the takbirat al-ihram, but makes the intention of both of them, then it will be sufficient. And the bigger takbir will be in place of the smaller takbir. Okay? So the position that the, our author is holding is similar to this position, except that in this position, which Ibn Qudama is mentioning, he says that you can have an intention you can have an intention for both of the takbirs, okay? But I'm telling you that the author's position is that if you make the takbir al ihram it will suffice you in that you don't need to make a, 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 a takbir for ruku, okay? But with the condition that you cannot have the intention uh, that you have two takbirs in one. 
The author, he says, وَلَا قِرَاءَةَ عَلَىٰ مَأْمُومٍ The author, he says that there's no recitation upon the followers, okay, in the Salat al-Jama'ah. And they base this upon the ayah, Surah Al-A'raf, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا الْقُرْيَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصِطُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ And if the Qur'an is recited, then listen to it and be attentive, be quiet, in, uh, perhaps, and hopefully you will gain mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Imam Ahmad, he said, أَجْمَعُوا عَلَىٰ أَنَّهَا نَزَلَتْ أَوْ نُزِلَتْ فِي الصلاة. It's uh, agreed upon by the scholars that this verse was revealed pertaining to the Salah. So the verse says, if the Qur'an is recited, then you should remain silent and you should pay attention so that perhaps you will gain mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is the way to dalala from the ayah? What is the way of extracting the evidence from the ayah to support what the Imam is saying? That there is no recitation upon the ma'moom in the salah. That the follower in the congregation doesn't have to recite. Tayyib, the point of evidence is that here the follower is being told that they should listen and they shouldn't recite, they should be quiet. And this is pertaining to any verses in the Quran. So all of the Quran, apart from Surah Al-Fatiha, is not obligatory in the Salah. So if you are being told that you have to be silent and you have to listen pertaining to verses which are not obligatory in the Salah, then min bab al-awla, then it's even more so important for you to be silent with regards to that which is obligatory in the Salah, which is Surah Al-Fatiha. Okay, so we're being told to be silent with regards to all of the other verses apart from Surah Al-Fatiha and including Surah Al-Fatiha, then it's even more so obligatory for us to be quiet and silent with regards when Surah Al-Fatiha is being recited. And also from the aql, from the intellect, is if that the ma'moom are busy reciting behind the imam when the imam is reciting, then what is the point of the imam reciting? It's like the imam is reciting only for himself. Because the point of the imam reciting loudly is that those behind him will listen. So if nobody's listening, they're reciting themselves, then there's no point to the Imam reciting loudly. This is another ta'leel. And also we have in the hadith of Ahmad, where the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ كَانَ لَهُ إِمَامْ فَقِرَاءَةُ إِمَامِهِ لَهُ قِرَاءَ Okay, whoever has an Imam that is leading him in the Salah, then the Imam's recitation for him would be recitation. Okay, meaning that the person doesn't have to recite and in fact shouldn't recite. So some of the ulama, like Imam Bukhari, they said that this hadith is not authentic, but many of them said it is authentic. And in fact, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimullah ta'ala, he said the majority of the Salaf, they took this hadith to be applicable in the uh, aspect of fiqh that we are speaking about, as mentioned by Sheikh Fahad al-Mutiri. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimullah ta'ala, he gives tafsil in this mas'ala about reciting behind the Imam. He gives tafsil, he gives a separation of issues and further information. He says that if the Salah is Salat al jahriyyah the Salah which is loud, wherein the Imam is reciting in the first two raka'at, then in these two raka'at, the Ma'moom shouldn't recite anything from Surah Al-Fatiha. Rather, they should listen to the Imam's recitation and that would suffice them. However, it is, if it is Salat al the quiet Salah, then in this situation, the Imam, he should recite. Okay, based upon the general Hadith with the Prophet said that there is no prayer for the person unless he recites Surah Al-Fatiha. Okay, so Imam Ibn Taymiyyah he makes tafsil. Our author, as a recap, he said that the ma'moom doesn't recite in the salah behind an imam in congregation. The author he says, "Wa yustahabu fi israri imamihi," and it's recommended that the person who is praying behind behind the imam he recites in the Israr of the Imam. The Israr of the Imam, as we mentioned in the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah, is that when the Imam is quiet in the third and the fourth raka'ah, okay, or in the uh, Salah, which is Sirriya, the Salah, where the Imam is not reciting loudly, in the silent prayers, or in the third and the fourth raka'ah of the loud prayers. So where the Imam is not reciting, it's recommended that the person recites Surah Al-Fatiha then, okay. The author, he says, wa sukutihi. And also in the parts where the Imam is quiet, okay, where the Imam is quiet in his sakatat, uh, for example, where the Imam has recited Surah Al-Fatiha and now he has a pause if he has so before he goes on and he recites another surah from the Quran, then in this pause the Ma'moom can recite Surah Al-Fatiha. So wherever there's sakatat, wherever the Imam is silent after having recited Surah Al-Fatiha, 
then the ma'mum can, it's recommended for him to recite Surah Al-Fatiha in that situation. The author, he says, may Allah have mercy upon him, وَإِذَا لَمْ يَسْمَعْهُ لِبُعْدٍ لَا لِتَرَشٍ That the person, it's recommended for them to recite Surah Al-Fatiha in these following situations. In the situation where you cannot hear what the Imam is saying, you cannot hear what the Imam is saying because you are far away, or because the person is deaf, hard of hearing, okay? So in the situation of not being able to hear what the Imam is saying due to being far away, it's recommended for you to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Not if you are hard of hearing, okay? Not if you are hard of hearing, it's not recommended. Why? Because with regards to the person who is hard of hearing, if he's amongst a group of people that can hear normally and he starts to recite Surah Al-Fatiha, it's going to be tashwish. It's going to be um, some type of commotion and causing annoyance to those who are around him because it will be disturbing the salah, right? However, if that person, uh, if, if there's not going to be any tashwish in the sense that the deaf person knows that he can recite it without making it loud, then in that situation he can do so. So the author, he said, it's permissible for the one who is far away to recite it, okay? Now, why is it permissible for the one who is far away to recite it, okay? Meaning the group of people who cannot hear the Imam, it's permissible for them to recite it, but not permissible for the one who is unable to hear it due to hearing issues. So I said that the one who is, has hearing issues, if he recites it right, he can't hear himself recite, so he's going to make some annoyance to those that are around him, maybe he'll be reciting it too loud. But then why is it permissible, permissible for those who are far away from the Imam or who cannot hear the recitation of the Imam to recite the Surah Al-Fatiha? Why do you think it's permissible? Question to yourselves. We're saying it's not permissible for the deaf person, but for the ones who cannot hear the Imam, it's permissible for them. Why? Tayyib, one of the reasons that is mentioned here by Sheikh Fahad Al-Mutiri and others, they said, Look, when you're a group of people that cannot hear the recitation of the Imam, then all of you are in the same situation. So if all of you recite, then all of you are in need to recite and you're not affecting, you're not, commo you're not causing commotion for anybody. Whereas that person who is hard of hearing, who cannot hear himself recite, if he starts to recite, he's going to cause commotion for those around him. So this is the point pertaining to what the Imam is saying. The Imam, he said as a recap, that if you cannot hear it due to being far away from the Imam, and that also uh, refers to points where the speakers are not working, etc., then in this situation, it's recommended for you to recite Surah Al-Fatiha, not if the uh, person is deaf, not in that situation, unless the deaf person knows that he's not going to cause a commotion for those around him. The author, he says, وَيَسْتَفْتِحُ وَيَسْتَعِيدُ فِي مَا يَجْهَرُ فِيهِ إِمَامُهُ the author he says that the istiftah, the dua al istiftah, that subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika and others, and to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this should be said in the salah. So you've come to the salah and the Imam is halfway through reciting a surah after Surah Al Fatiha. So whether this is in a loud prayer or a silent prayer, it's highly recommended for you to make your dua al istiftah and to seek refuge uh, in the beginning of the prayer because you joined the Salah late. The author, he says, قَوْلُهُ وَمَنْ رَكَعَهُ سَجَدَ قَبْلَ إِمَامِهِ فَعَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَرْفَعَ لِيَأْتِي بِهِ بَعْدَهُ Whoever makes a ruku or a sujood before the Imam has done so, then he has to return immediately as soon as he remembers to return to the position of following the Imam. Why? Because in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ said, لَا تَسْبِقُونِي بِالْرُقُوءِ وَلَا بِالسُّجُودِ وَلَا بِالْقِيَامِ The Prophet ﷺ said, Do not precede me with a ruku, nor a sujood, nor by standing. So none of the pillars you are allowed to precede the Imam in, right? Rather you have to follow the Imam. So in this situation where a person has preceded the Imam by making ruku before the Imam has made ruku, okay, then the salah is going to be invalid. Unless the person realizes and returns to be in a situation where he can be again following the Imam. For example, the person has gone into the Raku and the Imam is standing. So the, the person realizes now, the Ma'mun realizes that I've preceded the Imam, so he gets back up and then again he goes into the Raku while the Imam is in Raku. Okay, if the Imam didn't go into the Raku, then he has to get back up and wait for the Imam to go into the Raku. 
So the point is that if he's preceded the Imam, he has to go back to a situation where he's not preceding the Imam. And if he didn't do so, then the Salah is going to be invalid. As the author says in the next statement, قَالَ فَإِن لَمْ يَفْعَلْ عَمْدًا بَطَلَاتِ If the person doesn't do this intentionally, mean that intentionally he knows that he's ahead of the Imam and he doesn't go back to correct his situation, then his Salah is going to be invalid because this is like a person who has left off a wajib. What is the wajib? The wajib is that he has to be following his Imam. So because he intentionally left the wajib off and he intentionally moved before his imam, then his salah is going to be invalid. The author, he says, وَإِنْ رَقَعَ وَرَفَعَ قَبْلَ رُقُوءِ إِمَامِهِ عَالِمًا عَمْدًا بَطَلَتْ And if the person, he makes not only the ruku before the imam, he also gets up from the ruku before the imam. If he does this uh, knowingly and intentionally, then his salah is going to be invalid, right? وَإِنْ كَانَ جَاهِلًا أَوْ نَاسِيًا بَطَلَتْ الرَّقْعَةُ فَقَدْ However, if the person is, does this out of forgetfulness or out of some type of ignorance, then in this situation, the salah is not going to be valid. But what would be invalidated is that one rak'ah that he did this in. Why would it be invalid? Because of the fact that he didn't follow the imam in that rukun. So that rukun of the ruku was done without following the imam. Therefore, it invalidates the whole rak'ah. So because of that, the person would have to make this up, this rak'ah, at the end of the salah. طيب. The author, he says, وَإِنْ رَكَعَ وَرَفَعَ قَبْلَ رُقُوئِهِ ثُمَّ سَجَدَ قَبْلَ رَفْعِهِ بَطَلَتْ In another situation where the person does two rukun in front of the imam, he makes a rak'ah and then he gets up from the rak'ah, okay, before his imam has gone into the ruku, and also he makes a sajda, he goes into sujood before his imam. Then in this situation, again, as in the previous situations, his prayer is going to be invalid if he did this intentionally. Illa jahil wa nasi, except for the one who is forgetful or did this out of some type of ignorance. Wa yusalli tilka raka qadaan. Then in this situation, the person who did it out of forgetfulness or ignorance, then they would have to make up the raka once the salah is over. Once the imam has finished with the taslim, the person would have to make that raka up again. So pertaining to this issue, which is known as a sabq. We mentioned that a sabq, if it's done intentionally, the person would break his uh, salah. If it's done unintentionally, uh, in the sense that he didn't go back to catch the imam in the ruku, okay, or in the rukun that he preceded the imam in, then that whole raka would have to be made up again. So this is known as a sabq. With regards to following the imam, there's another two uh, items that need to be mentioned. One of them is al-muwafiqah. Al-muwafiqah is another description of following the imam which is wherein you do the act at the same time that the Imam is doing the act. This is also not allowed to be done, especially when it pertains to doing the Takbirat al-Ihram or the Taslim. What it means is that when the Imam makes the Takbir Allahu Akbar, you say it exactly at the same time. Or when the Imam makes Assalamu Alaikum the Taslim, you do it exactly at the same time. This is not allowed for you to do and it would invalidate the Salah, okay? Especially the Takbirat al-Ihram. So al-muwafiqa, doing the actions exactly at the same time that the imam is doing the action is not allowed. Rather what should be done is al-mutaba'a. Al-mutaba'a is that you follow the imam. After the imam has done the action, then you go ahead and do it. Okay, because in Sahih Muslim from the hadith of Bara ibn Azib, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's, it's narrated by Bara ibn Azib that he said, Kunna nusalli khalf al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We used to pray behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fida qala sami allahu li man hamida. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa say, Sami allahu man hamida, lam yahni ahaduna, lam yahni ahadun minna dhaharahu hatta wada'a rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam jabhatahu ala al-ard. That when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, Sami allahu man hamida, none of us would make a movement, none of us would make a movement until the Prophet ﷺ had fully prostrated. So they would follow the Imam, meaning that when they would get up uh, from Ruku, it would be when the Prophet ﷺ had said, Samiya Allah al-Manhamidah, okay, then they would get up. And once he said, Samiya Allah al-Manhamidah, they wouldn't move to go into Salah, into Sujood, until the Prophet ﷺ had gone into Sujood. So this is what Mutaba is. This is how the following of the Imam should be. That you do it after the Imam has gone into the next position. However, the ulama, they mention, that if you fearful, you know that your imam is very fast, he's one of those uh, you know, supersonic imams, that he goes very quickly. Uh, in this situation, then as soon as the imam moves and he hasn't gone to the next position, you can also move. But ensuring that you are behind the imam. 
but the best and preferred way is that you go into the next position once the Imam has gone into the next position. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, وَيُسَنُّ لِلْإِمَامِ أَتَخْفِيفِ مَا الْإِتْمَامِ It's recommended that when a person is leading in Salah as an Imam, he's leading a congregation, that the person he makes takhfif. Because in the hadith of Bukhari Muslim narrated by Abu Huraira, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا صَلَّ أَحَدُكُمْ لِلنَّاسِ فَلْيُخَفِّفْ That if one of you is praying for the people, then he should make the Salah less. He should make it light and easy upon the people. فَإِنَّ مِنْهُمْ الضَّعِيفُ وَالسَّقِيمُ وَالْكَبِيرُ for verily from amongst them is the one who is weak and the one who is in a state, could be in a state of sickness or the one who is quite elderly, okay? Whereas if one is praying for himself, praying by himself or with a group of friends, etc., then he can elongate his prayer as much as he wants to. So the sunnah in praying uh, with the jama'ah is that you make takhfif, that you lessen the uh, length of your recitation. However, this issue needs to be looked in in detail and to study how did the Prophet ﷺ used to pray, what type of surahs did he used to recite. Because when takhfif is mentioned, when uh, lessening the salah is mentioned, we have uh, our own trail of thought and what is intended is different because what is intended is how did the Prophet ﷺ used to make takhfif. So that is an issue which needs to be read upon and researched upon. The Imam he says, وَتَطْوِيلُ الرَّكْعَةِ الْأُولَىٰ أَكْثَرَ مِنَ الثَّانِيَةِ That when you are leading, you make the first raka'ah along with its ruku' and sujood longer than the other raka'at and ruku' and sujood. طيب. وَيُسْتَحَبُّ الْإِنْتِذَارِ دَاخِلْ دَاخِلٍ مَا لَمْ يَشُقُّ عَلَىٰ مَعْمُومٍ And it's recommended that you wait for the person who is entering upon the salah, okay? As long as this doesn't become difficult upon the followers. So for example, if the Imam, he's in a situation of ruku' And then he hears somebody who is coming towards the saf, or he hears that the door of the masjid has opened, he knows somebody is going to come uh, to join him in ruku, then it's recommended for the uh, imam to wait uh, as long as this doesn't cause difficulty uh, upon the rest of the congregation, as long as it's generally said that it's not um, unnatural and unnatural waiting. So he, it's recommended to, for him to wait a period of time. Uh, but a point to mention here is that we shouldn't be in that situation. We should always try to be in the jama'ah, be in the congregation from the takbirat al-ihram, from the first takbirat. And people of piety in the salaf, they would see this as being something very big. They would, they would race to the masjid to ensure that they would get there for the virtue of the takbirat al-ihram. The author, he says, وَإِذَا اسْتَعْدَنَتْ الْمَرْأَةُ إِلَى الْمَسْجِدْ كُرِهَا مَنْؤُهَا That if a woman, she seeks uh, permission from the husband or her, um, or her wali, to go to the masjid, then she shouldn't be uh, denied. It's disliked for her to be denied. And the hadith in Bukhari in Muslim of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu said, إِذَا اسْتَعْدَنَتْ إِمْرَأَةُ أَحَدِكُمْ إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ فَلَا يَمْنَعْهَا That if one of your women seeks your permission to go to the masjid, then she shouldn't be uh, rejected. It shouldn't be said to her, no. It's disliked to say no to her, right? Now, uh, Imam Ibn Qudama, he said, it's in fact, it's haram to say no to her because the Prophet is saying, don't prevent them. Don't prevent them from going to the masjid. But this is with the condition that there's no fitna, whether it be in the woman herself or whether it be in the way, uh, the path going to the masjid or in the masjid itself. So the woman, she should be fully covered. She shouldn't be wearing makeup. She shouldn't be wearing uh, any perfume. She shouldn't be going on a path where there's going to be so many men. Uh, she shouldn't be... Uh, in any type of fitna, in any type of situation, then it would be allowed for her to go to the masjid. Okay, if there's a fitna, then it's not allowed for her to go to the masjid. The author he says, However, if she is to pray in her house, that is better for her. And in the hadith in Abi Dawood and Ahmed, the Prophet ﷺ said, For the women to pray in their houses is better for them. And this, the context of this was when, was when the Prophet ﷺ was in Medina as the Imam. So imagine the Prophet ﷺ, he's the Imam, and the Prophet ﷺ is praying in his masjid. Yeah, he's telling the women of that time, the Sahabiyat, that it's better for you to pray in your houses, that for you to pray in your houses, you will get a lot more reward. So how about any Imam after the Imam of the Prophet ﷺ, or any masjid other than the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ? It's not so important for the women to go to the masjid. However, the author, he said, if they want to go, they shouldn't be prevented, as long as there's no fitna. And he reminded that to pray in the houses is better for them. What's the exception from this? 
So what's the exception for them that is better for them to pray in their houses? When is it better for them not to pray in their houses? There's an exception. What is that exception? Tayyip, the exception is uh, Salat al-Eid because the Prophet وسلم, he ordered the women to attend the Musalla of Eid even those who are on menstruation. So here this is the exception that uh, it's it's uh, highly recommended for the women that they should go out and they should uh, observe the festivities of Eid and pray with the Imam if they are not menstruating. Excuse me. The author he's going to move on now. Faslun fi ahkam al imama. The author is going to talk about now the uh, rulings pertaining to the one who is the Imam. And I think we'll leave this for the next session, inshallah, because we've taken quite a bit. And an important point to mention is that you must revise. Wherever you are learning, revise it and review. Make notes, make your notes in the best of ways. Share your notes with your colleagues, with your friends. Have somebody as a partner that's going to help you revise, whether it be a family member or outside of your family member. And in this month of Ramadan, we should remember, though it's highly recommended for us to recite as much Quran as possible and to do extra acts of worship like praying and nawafil, it's also highly recommended to continue seeking knowledge because this is an act of worship which is imperative and it's beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a gift. Any mistakes and shortcomings were from myself and shaitan. If you have any questions, feel free to ask or to send as a uh, WhatsApp question whenever you want to do so. If you have any questions, I'll wait a few moments.